Hey guys, how's it going? Um, I'm making a quick video today because I had several of you email me and ask me, you know, if I'm quitting YouTube or whatever. It's been a while since my last video. Um, no, I'm not quitting. We're still projecting away over here. Um, I just, I try not to spam the internet with videos to keep some YouTube algorithm that I don't care about happy. And I try to only make videos um, if I feel like I've got something to share that's actually going to help somebody. So, in, in the spirit of that today, I'm going to do a video on where I am in making my Powerball out of an old Nissan Leaf battery pack, out of a Nissan Leaf, um, and specifically focus on three tripping stones that I've run into uh, in that construction pro process. Um, I wanted to make it, even though I'm not done with the build, because they're all still, still real fresh in my head, um, and by the time I get everything wrapped up and complete, I might have forgotten a few of those hurdles and tripping stones that I found along the way. Um, and I want to make a video on those so nobody else has to repeat all my mistakes. First off, pretty much I've seen several of these builds on various uh, Powerwall forms. Everybody that does one uses some form of shelving to house all the modules. So, I knew about how many modules I was going to have on each shelf. I knew that it was going to be about 300 pounds. And so I bought a shelf that was spec for right around like 400 pounds per shelf. Um, not really, you know, thinking, okay, that's at least 100 more than I need, that'll be fine. Not the case. Um, even though the shelf is spec for like four or five or 600, when you put 300 pounds of battery modules on it, it bows down a whole lot. So when I did that, and I rested my bus bars across all these modules here, the shelf was actually bowing so low that these terminals on the middle modules were beneath where that bus bar was when it went straight across. So when you're selecting your shelving unit for your power wall, uh, make sure that you get something that's way, way overkill, at least twice the weight that you're actually going to put on it, so that you don't have to deal with that bowing issue. I had to go in there, you can kind of see these wooden blocks down here and shim that bottom shelf. I had to go in behind this top shelf here and put a, about an inch thick threaded rod that I didn't put a steel bar underneath here with and kind of tighten the nut to lift this shelf up. It was a whole pain in the butt to get this thing to work because those shelves were struggling so much under that weight. So when you go and build your power wall, don't make the same mistake. Lesson number two, um, usually when you buy these modules, they will come with little spacers that go in between them. Um, they're the exact spacers that Nissan puts in the battery packs, in the leaves. Um, but depending on where you get your modules from, you may not have enough of those spacers, and you'll have to go back through and use washers right here. If you run out of those spacers, you'll actually have to use washers to keep these modules spaced appropriately. And you want to make sure you've got exactly the right number to keep the, the flushes, the spaces even. Right here you can see th these two modules have been tightened under quite a bit of compressive force, but there's no pinching of the edge of this module because I made sure I had exactly the right number of washers in there to space those properly. If you have to come up with your own spacers or shims to keep these modules from kind of smashing into each other and keep them spaced appropriately while you tighten and compress them. Um, make sure that you've got that distance measured just right. You're using exactly the right number of washers on each one. Otherwise, when the edges of those little sardine can looking modules come together, you can deform the edges of them because they don't have that support in between. Uh, lesson number three is when, if you're going to go with the horizontal approach, um, make sure that you have some kind of foam underneath or some kind of compressive material in between that hard shelving and your battery module. On the edges of these modules, they're not flat. They've got these little lips right here, and you want that to not be kind. You don't want all the weight of that entire row of modules resting on that thin little edge there. Um, you want that to kind of sink into a material that's going to distribute the weight evenly along this face here. A lot of people that I see build these go with the uh, 
vertical stack approach. Um, and I'll see, I've seen people stack these modules as much as like 17 or 20 high. And the reason I didn't really want to go that way is because in addition to the compressive force, they're putting these, uh, these bracket bookends on these rows of modules and then tightening nuts on the rods that run through them all to keep the modules compressed. So in addition to that compressive force, you've got, you know, 17 of these modules. That's 170 pounds of force pushing down on a battery module that was not designed to be weight bearing. None of these batteries, when they're in the car, they're all under a compressive force, but none of them are weight bearing. And I don't know exactly what the mechanical failure point is for these things. And I don't want to find out. So I went with the horizontal stack approach because that allows you to ensure that the compressive force on every single module in the row is pretty much exactly the same. So those are the three biggest mistakes that I made um, that I'm letting you know about. So hopefully when you go, if you're going to go and build one of these out of your old Nissan Leaf battery pack, you don't make it. Uh, use a shelf that is way over spec to the amount of weight you're going to put on it. Make sure that you shim or space, you know, the space in these modules are exactly perfect so that you don't pinch those modules and at the same time you don't put so much space in between them that they have room to expand when they charge. And number three, put some kind of compressive material underneath these if you're using the horizontal array so that they have something to kind of evenly distribute the weight across the bottom of the modules and you don't have all of that weight resting on just the edge of these modules. Okay, those are the mistakes to avoid. Um, I wanna walk you guys real quick through what all the pieces in this are um, so that you kinda know what I've been working on and where this is going. Um, first off, this is seven groups of 12 modules. And you can kinda see the breaks right here. That's one group of 12. That's the next group of 12. Next group of 12. And the voltage increase in between each one of these little jumps is 3.7 volts. So that's 3.7, that's 3.7. And it builds up from the master negative to the master uh, positive up here of a difference of about uh, 53 volts. Technically it's a 48 volt power wall, but from fully charged to fully discharged, it can range from like 40 volts up to uh, like 64 or something, somewhere in that spectrum. Now, as your power wall charges and discharges, some of these groups will have slightly more or less resistance than others, um, just because some of the modules are a little older or uh, for a multitude of different reasons, they're gonna have slightly different resistances. So the voltages are gonna slowly get out of balance over time. The component that makes sure that they stay balanced enough to be safe is your battery management system or BMS. So I went with the Dally 200 amp right here and you can see it's got wires that go to every cell in the series and <coughs> they go to every cell in the series. Uh, that comes with a Bluetooth module that links pretty painlessly to uh, an app you can download for your phone. So you can remotely monitor your system and make sure everything's staying right where you want it to be. Um, and it was actually pretty easy to set up. I wish they included a longer wiring harness. I had to go back through there and extend all these wires to make it to these groups that are way over here. Um, but I was actually really impressed. That, my multimeter, reads out to four decimal places, and it's giving me the exact same reading, like 3.842 volts, that the Dally VMS is giving me. So there's um, a great degree of accuracy so far, and... So I, I haven't used that through a whole bunch of cycles yet, so I can't do a complete review on it, but no red flags so far. Next component. The AC system that's going to be inside this power wall. That's something I'm doing differently from all the other builds too. A lot of people say that, well, the system doesn't generate that much heat when it's running.
The problem with my Powerwall is it's in a garage in Texas and it can easily get up to 95 degrees in here. And I know that the difference between a 65 degree battery pack and a 95 degree battery pack is a whole lot of cycles. Now, me and you, and anybody that drives Leaf, we get these modules for free because we're just taking them out of the old pack in our car. But still, the value of a 27 kilowatt hour power wall is huge. Tesla has so many backward, they won't even sell you one anymore. But their 13 kilowatt hour power wall, which is half this size, goes for like eight or nine thousand dollars. So if you were to buy this commercially, this would be like a twenty thousand dollar system. So for me, spending seven hundred dollars on a window unit to considerably increase the longevity of a system that, that is worth that much or would cost us that much if we built it was a no-brainer. So the AC is going to go in here. We're going to build a little insulated wooden box around it with a plexiglass cover so we can see everything that's going on in there. And our inverter charge controller right here will go on the side of this little server box. And this does serves two functions. It takes the power coming in from the solar panels and charges the batteries. And it also takes the power from the batteries and turns it into the 120 volt AC that we get in like the, uh, the outlets of our house. So I'll use that to basically have a couple of outlets on the outside of the server box that we're gonna use to charge the electric cars when they're parked in the garage um, and run some climate control in here and do a few other things. Basically trying to take, use our old electric car battery to charge our electric vehicles off grid so that the, the fuel bill for those electric vehicles doesn't wind up on our utility bill at the end of the month. Okay, so the next step for me is to connect the inside half of the split AC unit to the outside half. Right here, I'll have to drill a little three inch hole in the brick there to get the Freon lines through. And that'll also serve as a convenient opening to run the solar, the solar power input from the panels we're gonna put in the yard through that hole and connect that to the power wall in there. Um, I've already got one kilowatt hour of panels installed. The chicken coop out there, the birds needed some shade, and I'll probably do a, another three or four kilowatts on trusses out there in the yard at angles that's gonna give us good power from sunrise to sunset. All right, so hopefully next time you see me, all this is done and being built. In the meantime, if you are building a power wall, out of Nissan Leaf battery modules. Odds are, if you're seeing this video, I'm already done with mine. Uh, feel free to email me at the email in the video description and uh, I'll help you out if you have any questions. Thank you as always to my Patreon sponsors uh, for helping me finance some of these experiments and just for the, the vote of confidence. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm gonna cut to an economy via the week right here and I'll see you guys next time. So before I post an economy via the week, I always research the seller on eBay or Auto Tempest or Facebook Marketplace to make sure the car is still available and available at that price. For most of the two and a half years that I've had this little YouTube channel, you could trust that a three or four thousand dollar leaf would still be there the next day. The leaf I bought for three thousand dollars sat on Craigslist for three weeks while I haggled the seller down. You put that same car online now at that price and it's gone in three hours. The volume of vehicles for sale in the U.S. is down by almost 70% year over year, and prices are way up. EVs are still way cheaper than gas cars to own in the long run, but at these inflated prices, I don't really consider anything a great deal anymore. I still see a few Leafs here and there for under 5000 very rarely, but they're gone before I can put, the, put a video together or contact the seller and make sure it's a good offer and not some phishing scam. So for that reason, I'm going to temporarily discontinue the Economy V segment at the end of my videos until the U.S. auto market returns to some state of normality. That's it for today's episode. Thank you once again to all my Patreon sponsors. Thanks for watching. And I'll be back with another video on turning our old Leaf batteries into stationary power storage here in a bit.